AIA Australia, helping your clients in their time of need is our number one priority. In 2016, we paid over $1.15 billion in claims to both retail and group members. That's over $4.5 million every working day. To offer your clients cover you can trust, chat to your AIA CDM today. Welcome, Steve. Great to have you. Thanks, Ben. Great to be here. It's, uh, I'm just glad it wasn't me with the IT issues. Um, it usually is, so it's a, a bit of a change. So any, anything's great. I'm grateful for that. Steve, you have absolutely nailed it. Um, for, uh, for everyone watching in, Steve, I'd love for you to just give us a bit of uh, your background, it, it, background in, an, in, in the advice industry and then into your business and how that's, uh, that's sort of evolved over time. Thanks, Ben. It's, uh, it's a long, long and sort of winding road, I guess, my involvement in advice. Uh, my background is uh, from the banking uh, industry. So I uh, left school and spent the first nine years of my work life with Westpac in a variety of roles through branch banking, commercial banking, uh, and, you know, ultimately sort of getting really interested in becoming an advisor. It certainly didn't um, eventuate within Westpac at that stage uh, for me. So I spent a couple more years out of Westpac doing some mortgage broking uh, and first entered our profession in 1995 when I became a branch advisor with Suncorp. Um, so Suncorp uh, had uh, in its infancy first couple of years of branch advisors. Uh, so they were learning a lot. It was a good place to get a grounding. Uh, I moved through the, that advice network into sort of regional management and then project management with, with them until 2003 when, um, you know, they were going through massive changes. The focus was coming off uh, delivering client uh ongoing service uh, as far as what, what I viewed that relationship should be. Uh, so um, I had an opportunity to leave the organisation favourably and I did that and um, more sales management and then over to MLC as a practice development manager in 2005. There for three years, helping other advice businesses build, grow, segment, become more efficient, market their services and recruit the right people. Uh, and then in 2007, I started talking to one of the principals uh, within the group who was looking at exiting uh, the business uh, about what I needed to do more specifically to actually get back into client-facing advice. Uh, and I ended up buying that practice uh, midway through 2008, have been here ever since. So that got me into um, where I'm at. So I was very glad to make that move. Um, it's been a yep. fantastic learning curve since being here. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. And so what did the business look like when you, when you bought it in, in 2008? Um, it was typical, I guess, of uh, a lot of practices at that time where principals had sort of seen some of the writing on the wall with regards to changing attitudes around fees, changing attitudes around client service. So at that point, there had been uh, what were called at that time service agreements implemented with clients where a variety of services were put on the table for uh, a remuneration that included some trailing commission on investments and superannuation. Uh, but at the same time, there was like a cocktail arrangement where there was an advisor service fee, percentage-based advisor service fee added so that you got to a, a point where the remuneration um, met the services that were being delivered. Um, so that's what, that's sort of, we probably had about 300, 350 clients at that stage at various levels of engagement and uh, obviously um, fortunate enough to uh, buy a practice where there was uh, a good level of efficiency already and a, a long-standing support person that had been working with the principal um, so in that, in that basis, there are a lot of well-formed processes. We just had too many clients and that's really what I, what I struck when I, when I first uh, got into this business. 
Yeah, so I, and I know that we were chatting about this the other day and you, you told me that uh, you did some, obviously after getting into the business, a, a lot of thinking about, you know, what you wanted the business to look like in the future. And then around 2009, 2010, you did a bit of a, uh, a, a bit of a reposition. Can you tell us about that that process? What drove you to get there? What the thought, what the thinking was around that, and then what the results were. So I guess um, everyone on the on the call today might sort of remember the little thing that we had in two thousand and seven called the GFC, um, meeting the clients uh, coming through the GFC and ultimately exiting the GFC, sort of in March of two thousand and nine was was really the best thing to frame my views about what I wanted to, to go forward with as a business. Um, with such a broad range of people uh, on board, you know, all contributing a certain amount of the revenue, uh, I really had to have a really broad brush approach to, to try and communicate, com- keep communicating through the GFC and keep that revenue, um, which obviously is the lifeblood of a business where you've got expenses and you've got to pay the bank back um, and you've, you know, because of my own personal circumstances, um, I borrowed money um, from the vendor of the business for the first 12 months to enable me just to be able to make the purchase. So that was all happening. So the the renovation, I guess, if you like, happened after I had a bit of experience with the various you know client bases and, and I got a bit of a better idea about the services that I wanted to deliver and what I wanted the business to look look like. And it was a much it's a much reduced um, scale of reference in that I realised I could only really deliver top quality service to a much reduced client base. So um, within my licensee, there was an opportunity to um, sort of transfer the relationships of a number of those clients that through that two year period I found most difficult to engage with um, back to uh, their license back to the license. Uh, and they were there with it. They were there with a check, and they organised a buyer, and it was it was a really straightforward process. But what I was left with was a business where there was probably, I guess, about 140 active clients. But the clients that I felt that were ideal for where I wanted to go, and they were people um, that the most important criteria were people that were prepared to take advice, that relied sort of on our expertise rather than uh, the clients that would second guess why they have been recommended a certain thing and say, well, yeah. you know, I don't think I need to hold as much cash as you want to recommend for me. I, I would like everything to go into growth. Um, so that's really what I wanted to sort of take forward with a much reduced number of clients uh, so I could sort of focus my efforts uh, on, on bringing those people through and walking through their lives with them. Sure. And so, so you, you, you want to work with people that value uh, your advice and are, uh, you know, happy to sort of delegate um, uh, that, those duties to yourself. Were, were there any other criteria in terms of what, um, what sort of advice they wanted or what sort of areas that they wanted you to, to, to assist them in? I guess through the GFC, the importance of, uh, having those people uh, around uh, your potential clients, that would be a positive influence um, was was something that was pretty important. And by that, I mean uh, the, and we'd already sort of started doing a, a bit of the family advice piece, um, you know, uh, before we uh, sort of went through the renovation. So we'd actually um, have good recommendations for the next generation to come and see us from parents. Um, and it really helped sort of gender engender not only regeneration within the business or getting younger people to come through and get advice, but also it, the recommendation was coming from within the family in a lot of cases. So we really wanted to, to work hard on uh, building the family advice uh, as, as a centrepiece uh, for, for the business. The other criteria uh, for us were, um, we were, you know, really wanting to, to play a role, um, not just um, in the managing of superannuation or the managing of investments, but also to sort of be a, a face in our community uh, mm-hmm. as being um, 
active with financial literacy, as being seen as somewhat somewhat of an expert, I guess, in financial matters, um, and hence uh, generating the referrals and the interest in our services as a result of that. So um, we also look for opportunities with potential clients to extend that reach as well, whether those clients were sort of coming from accounting practices or from um, local area advertising that we've been doing. Mm. Um, it was all about getting the opportunity to talk to more like-minded people that valued advice. Sure. And so I know that you, well, you know, when we were chatting the other day, you were saying that you, you had a number of transactional clients and you, you just you established pretty clearly that they weren't going to fit in the sort of business that you wanted to be running going yeah. forward. But beyond, beyond um, you know, being a, a, a non-transactional client, were, there, were you um, specific in that, say, would you take on, uh, you know, an insurance-only client that was um, – that or take with you and it like a client that only wanted help in in that area or only wanted help with say yeah. the management of the superannuation fund or did you want to do more the you know the overall uh, advice piece? I'm probably at odds with um, maybe some some contemporary thinking about advice practices and what they look like in that um, you know, certainly particular, not so probably not as much now as when I was in that practice development role, um, there were um, potential advisors uh, looking to do what we call cold start. So actually come in with no clients and build a business where you've got a client that has a particular advice need uh, or advice needs is going to pay you $5,000 a year plus. So you're going to have a client base of 40, 50, 60 People. And if you've got anyone that doesn't fit that mould, you send them away. Um, I've never really been of that mindset because um, as going through the, um, the renovation process and getting more, my only criteria is really that they wanted to be engaged. They wanted to, to get our advice and listen. Um, and there were people that we met through, where we met and we'd had a deeper connection with through that advice, that renovation of the advice business that came out as being our ideal client later in the piece after asking to stay with us. Um, quite off the bat, there were people there that weren't engaged and weren't really um, sort of looking at their future needs. But, you know, circumstances happen one year, two year into our relationship where there's, um, you know, maybe an inheritance or maybe an insurance payout or that sort of thing where they actually then become that ideal client. So, um, when I've got um, referrals that come in, one of the um, referral partners that we had was an accountant that um, we specifically targeted um, to do the uh, insurance work uh, for referrals that they may have. They were doing a lot of self-managed super funds and, uh, and we sort of had the opportunity to, to get referrals for insurance only. So we did a lot of that. I mean, I'm not, um, I'm not sort of saying that, you shouldn't do that kind of work as well. It's just differentiating your offer to various people. Uh, the segmentation is where the work is done. You know, if you've got an insurance only client, you certainly have servicing responsibilities and you're certainly being paid to service that client through any trailing commissions you might receive. But mm. um, it's a different type of servicing to what you would be doing for a, uh, a full advice, um, holistic type client. So, it's yep. that then, you know, it's not about excluding uh, particular clients or client groups, um, but it's about making sure that you've got an appropriate service offering for everyone that you're dealing with. Sure. So I'm keen to I'm keen to jump into this segmentation piece because uh, I know that you you know you mentioned you started your business hundred uh, or when you when you renovated your business and I love that hmm. uh, term, by the by the way but. You, yeah. you ended up with about 140 clients. From that point, I know that you've, you know, you've grown it f further to you. You were at, um, when we were chatting a little while back, around 170-odd fully active clients. Um, for me, you know, as someone running a small business, I think uh, I would struggle to uh, find enough hours in the day to, uh, to service that many clients. So clearly you're running a very efficient business. And when we were chatting about that, you noted that one of the key ways that you've done that is through this segmentation. So... Can you, you tell us a bit about how you approach that and, and, you know, I suppose how you got started, whether that was something that you picked up through the PDM work that you did and, um, 
yeah, just just that how that's worked in practice in your business. Sure. Um, and with segmentation, I guess there's no right or wrong answer. It depends on the people that you've got in your client base. It's it's to me, I've been led to the various offers that we put in front of people by the people themselves. So, um, but what we started with was um, the typical sort of model where we, um, when I came in and looked at um, like revenue for work that we were doing for various people um, Mm -hmm. and what network needed to be done, um, we basically sort of built um, the typical platinum, gold, silver and bronze options and then an insurance only option um so platinum was uh, a couple of a couple of face-to-face reviews a year as a minimum um but that said a platinum is a a platinum is a movable feast given the number given the types of people that we actually have in that category so it might be the face-to-face um meetings that we arrange half yearly for one particular group uh, there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of clients we have that are expats that have moved around the Middle East and, and America um, and and for work. We will have a quarterly have a quarterly teleconference um, at a time of their um, of their choosing. So obviously it's an early morning or a late at night or whatever fits with their time zone. Um, yeah. But that's a that's a quarterly teleconference, and then you know when they come back to Australia to see family, then we do a they usually are back once a year. We do a face to face meeting there. So. Um, so platinum, we're probably of the, you know, if we're looking nowadays, we've probably got 165 of those clients that, um, are really active. We probably have about 30 to 35 platinum clients where we would be delivering that service. Um, the rest of them are a a higher touch as well, you know, in terms of making the phone calls, the checking in to make sure they're okay. Um, and generally just having a higher level of engagement. Um, within, within, um, like there's gold as well, which is, um, at least one face to face review that we will organize plus mailing of reports, telephone check-ins, but probably not to the same extent. Um, we have newsletter that, that comes out. We have client events where we will have people along. Um, and you know, there's, uh, a group of people there that also have very different needs. Like we might have, we do have a, a Centrelink offer as well, where uh, we become the correspondence nominees for a number of our elderly clients that are experiencing the uh, the hassle of having to go and line up to Centrelink to tell them about their new car or their um, renovations that they're planning to do or the 10,000 they want to give to their daughter or son. Um, so we actually, as correspondence nominees, can actually do a lot of that administration work via the, uh, the Centrelink portal uh, and we can um, liaise if there's any questions from a Centrelink perspective um, to, to a, you know, um, things that happen. Um, so that's that's pre- present, I guess, in mainly in the gold clients. Um, you know, the, the work that we do with Centrelink is part of our offer and it would elevate, you know, potentially where we're sort of not doing as much work in the lower orders of so silver we do We'd still do the face-to-face review, but we may not be um, Centrelink uh, correspondence nominees. We may not um, have uh, the same call pack pattern with those people as what we would have further up the uh, the chain. Yes, yeah, Steve. Um, sorry, sorry to jump in there. I was just I was going to point out on your website how you've got um, all these contact points that you're talking about. You seem yep. to have a really good consistency around that, and you sort of. You talk about not um, like the majority of the clients have been touched within the last three three months, and yep. like the systems around that. How do you? Yeah. How do you sort of yeah. make sure that happens? How do? What do you? What works and helps? Because a lot of practices, I think, struggle to sort of maintain consistency around doing that. Yeah. Look, I think uh, what I would be recommending very highly is uh, is a very good CRM. Um, and we're using X Plan uh, because you know we we can put the advice uh, and the uh, the modelling and all of that in beside our CRM. Uh, it also uh, allows us to run workflow, uh, and we basically will manage our contact program via the X Plan workflow, um, where the various people in the business will be tasked with uh, the the follow up um, around uh, around that. So. 
I'm the I'm the only uh, revenue generating advisor at the moment. I have an associate who's joined me, who's in on the in on the Facebook Live page at the moment, out in the other room, uh, Troy, um, and uh, I also have an assistant who uh, is very well known. My assistant's been with me since 2009, and Katrina comes from a background of having sort of a number of years within Centrelink herself, as well as 10, 11 years in an advice practice before she came to us. So I'm very fortunate in the staffing, but at the same time, it's very important to have the, uh, the workflow threads yeah. driving that contact. I'm curious with those workflow threads. Um, I guess a lot of people, there are options, and I know within Xplan that you can do automated when something gets to some, uh, a certain point, yep. like an automated email or a text message yep. even. Um, how do you make a decision? Do you use the automation pieces or is it all a task thing where one of the staff members will go and um, make that action? They'll send the email separately or, is it, or have you made use of the automation piece, pieces when it gets to that stage? So as far as the automation goes, um, with X-Plan, when, when the task comes up, we will get an email into our inbox, the person that is responsible for achieving, for doing that task. And as far as the contact process goes, um, it's horses for courses. So for example, our, our younger clients, it would be um, a check-in email or a text message um, or even a Skype call. Uh, for older clients, though, it would probably be picking up the phone and having a chat. So we've got a, a number of retirees, as I sort of mentioned. Um, we've fortunate enough to have um, retained the mums and dads of the younger parent, um, younger clients that we've brought on since uh, I bought the business. So they're more attuned to sort of having a phone call. Um, you know, well, you know, if there's a meeting that that's needed, we'll bring them in and sort of have some morning tea or go to their place and, and have morning tea. But um, it's as far as the automation goes, we get the email and then um, we will determine what the most appropriate sort of contact mechanism would be for those particular clients. Yeah, it's always seemed um, as much as you can automate these things. Yeah. I, I like what you're doing there in terms of the filter because all the clients are different. And if you are yeah. sort of standardized thing, it's taking away that personal side of things, I guess. To... Yeah, and I think really one of the things that I wanted to, to, to do a few years back was just do a, well, last year really, uh, is just do a bit of a temperature check to see um, how, our, how our efforts in that regard were being sort of perceived out there. Um, again, fortunate enough uh, to be offered through our licensee the ability to do a survey with core data uh, on our client base. And, um, and essentially that allowed us to gather a, a lot of feedback as to how we were seen uh, in the eyes of our clients. I know there are probably a few people on the on the call this afternoon that have actually gone through that process and it, it really is an eye opener um, as far as, you know, where you cut, where you sort of go, what you do with that data. I mean, um, it, it it's sort of... Great statistics on the website here, like net promoter yeah, we, score and the engagement piece and, yeah. Yeah, we brag about it a little bit. Um, and I guess one of the things that we brought out was, I guess... Um, it said, you know, that, that whole discussion about us contacting, having contacted a certain number of percentage of our clients um, within three months, of the, it was a high percentage of our client base. Um, you know, there was some argument that I guess we, maybe we were so, sort of over-servicing, um, but we had the processes and systems in place to be able to deliver those touch points. And um, when I've subsequently spoken to our clients because of the fact that we've been there and spoken to them face to face and always delivered on those meeting um, promises and obligations that we have under this, under the servicing, um, when they get a newsletter from us, they see that as a touch point. Now, when they get a phone call from us, they recognize that as a touch point. Uh, it's not so much just about the actual touch point. It's about doing enough so that your clients will actually recognize the particular contact as that touch point that you need to have. So yeah, the survey is really useful. In terms of um, those touch points and I guess <clears throat> trying to get the most efficiency in your business around that, do you have 
have you sort of have you set up templated things that can make that easier? How do you? As I know you've got all these segments. Have you tailored things to each of these segments that you'll do differently? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, within X Plan, also we've been able to run templated emails and templated uh, letter templates that attach to those tasks that we uh, are, um, are putting out there. So if it's an email or, a t or a, um, even a text, um, the issue that we've had with like just a technical issue with X-Plan is that we aren't uh, consistently able to email out of X-Plan. So people would be able to set up the email and have it sent automatically from the X-Plan software. We've actually, for um, to be sure that the email is actually getting there or the text message is being sent, we actually use the use a manual, we take it out and manually sort of go send the email through Outlook. Or to some people, um, we have a, uh, you know, a problem with our uh, Microsoft 365. I'm not sure if anyone else has experienced the same problems, but we, um, we have difficulties emailing uh, places like the AFA head, head office, uh, as well as um, in Brisbane, it's a, a, a Catholic education office is another one where our emails bounce back. So we've actually got to know that and make a manual workaround in some and cases. They put you so, in their spam, uh, their spam bucket. Steve. Yeah, it's a three Microsoft three sixty five thing. It's um, it's a DNS signature issue. Um, and my son's um, a computer a computer um, student at, uh, at university, and he's uh, apparently going to fix it for me. I'm just not holding my breath. <laughs> he probably just switch you to Gmail, Steve. Well, most of yeah, my... I made the switch this year, Steve. Yeah, I, uh... well, it works, definitely. Yeah. Everything uh, that I send to AFA or to the places where I know there's a problem, it comes from Gmail. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. So, Steve, like, I, I know... Um, uh, you, so, you, di you did this core data survey and, and figured out all of, you know, what your clients have valued. What changes, if any, did you make following the um, the the... the the research that you did and were there any, was there anything that really surprised you from the results that you saw? Yeah, I, um, I wasn't terribly surprised. I guess I was, um, I, I knew that we were, we were sort of paranoid about making sure that we had those touch points because in my experience, um, with working with advice practices from that PDM land and also even back as far as Suncorp, you know, um, when you actually um, guide a client through the process, uh, guide a client through tough times, say GFC is a classic example, that strength of that relationship um, is just absolutely gold. It, it makes a big difference. So when I got the, um, when I got the uh, core data survey, I knew that we could still continue to deliver the, uh, the contact points that, that we'd be, be become known for within that survey so we you know despite sort of saying we could free up some resources I don't I disagreed you know we sort of had a business coach who said oh, you could probably free up a few bit of resource because you don't need to be contacting your clients as much and and looking at my business I felt that we could continue to do that so we so we kept doing it um, some of the things that um, are starting to creep in now um, and I guess it's particularly personal are pertinent to my business being licensed with a large institutional licensee um, we started to have a, um, some comments around um, you know you're going to get the house product you know not necessarily from the older clients that have been around for a while but certainly some of the new ones that we've we've gathered through those referrals from accountants and um, you know advisor ratings is another place where we've got some referrals as well so um, mm -hmm those are the sorts of things that sort of force us for, for has forced me to have a look at just the way we engage people and, and what we actually stand for. I mean, um, I think an institutional licensee gives you um, a good backing um, and, and strength to stand behind you. Um, yeah. I know I've got the approved product list to, um, to give them choice as to the product, give me choices to what I recommend. Um, yeah but it's about articulating that a bit more with, uh, with clients and being on the front foot with that rather than having that come up as an objection at a point in the process. So 
that's that's a, one of the things. The other thing also that came out of the core data was the realisation, I guess, that while we're doing a good job with the numbers of people that we've been managing, um, we're at capacity in terms of um, there was no scope to do any more, you know, and, and if we um, if we wanted to grow, I need to um, I need to be seriously sort of moving towards getting more resources, and that's that's what we've done this year. Hi, yeah. Troy. <laughs> yeah, very good. I was going to say to the guys that are um, listening to us out there, there's um, there's some good resources on Steve's website. Um, I think courtesy of the MLC backing out the back there, but um, some good educational material. If anyone's looking for anything? There's a, a variety of um, different things. They look pretty good, Steve. Do they do they work okay? What you use out there with the clients? Yeah, that's. I mean, the newsletters. Uh, um, are well regarded like in terms of the the content we uh, it's a um the newsletter content is uh well there's a lot of mlc content but there's also content that comes from a group called client com um which is a uh, a small sort of it uh business on the central coast that has a specialty in websites and i don't think mlc are the the only people that use client com um but they can actually systemize things like budget updates and interest rate announcements and a whole range of different things. We only use um, a small part of what their offering is. Um, but, yeah, certainly a lot of those resources on my website, website be around, you know, the newsletters that we've, we've put out there. Um, it's, you know, it's a bit of a brochure site, but just with a little bit more in the brochure rather than um, sort of uh, the big automotive automation into um, client portfolios and all of that sort of thing. I'd rather, I'd rather have the client come to talk to us about their portfolio rather than yeah. sort of going in and doing those sorts of things. So my focus really is on, on the information and people can pick from it what they, uh, what they want to see. Well, Jackson, who's on the, he's, he's put a um, question in on the Facebook Live there and he's, he's asking sort of what do these touch points look like? What are, what are the agendas... And how are you, like, what do you cover off in these things? So a bit more nitty gritty in terms of what are you doing in these, um, at these points in time? So really there's, um, there's at our initial engagement with a client, um, we have a checklist of reasons why we will contact you. Um, and if, and also on the converse, if any of these particular circumstances occur, feel free to give us a call. So, um, you know, on the give us a call side, there'll be places, just the usual things that you might expect to see, like um, birth of a child, birth of a grandchild, um, you know, marriage, death in the family, um, you know, aged care discussions, a whole range of different things that, that would um, jog a person to give us a call. But our touch points are around things such as... Um, you know, the, the personal things like birthdays and anniversaries, um, work anniversaries as well as relationship anniversaries, um, kids' birthdays. Um, it's, not a, it's not an exhaustive list because, as I said, you know, our servicing is really all about the people that we've got in our client base um, and when we will identify that there's a, you know, a, re a need to be in contact, we'll, we'll certainly be there. It could be a business touch point as well. It could be, you know... Um, you know, for example, the um, the changes to uh, the Centrelink assets test um, was a uh, a big project that we had, sort of from about September through till November of last year, um, where the related so the people that were going to be impacted uh, were you know contacted, and we discussed with them what are the sort of advice uh, actions that we could possibly take to make things a little bit better. Um, where there's a tax change with regards to like what we've just been through with people that were pursuing a transition to retirement strategy, um, where there is a, a change that would make that less desirable or non-effective for, for some clients, um, it was a reason to be in contact and start to review. So um, the, the ones that I guess can be pre-programmed into the systems are, you know, birthdays, anniversaries, um, and family celebrations, the ones that the, the system pre-programs into the system are the tax and uh, legislative changes, market changes, you know, and then there's just for the, you know, the platinums and the goals, the, 
just to have a chat, um, catch up, you know, uh, and just say hi when, when we've got things going on. So I've got um, a program at the moment with um, one of my uh, platinum clients that's living overseas who in sort of in the coming years will be looking to move back to Australia. Um, we've been sort of uh, a set of actions about different uh, sort of investment portfolio actions that we need to take um, because they're coming from being a non-resident back to becoming a resident. So there's some there's some uh, implications for their investments and things that we need to do along the way. They own property in Australia as well as property overseas and we need to be talking about that with them at certain times before they come back. So um, the client will write their own story in a lot of ways in, in that type of circumstance. But, you know, we've got a lot of different types of stories out there. And Steve, do you ever find that with when you're doing these more frequent catch-ups with clients, just to, to follow up on Jackson's question, like that you're that you're struggling for things to to cover off, or when there's when there's no news, um, how do you approach uh, that? It's you know it sounds a bit trite, but really it's it's sort of about the relationship, and because we've been in contact sort of on a on a really frequent basis, we mm. have a really strong understanding of what's going on. Or like as, as strong as we we would like to have, sometimes a little bit too strong, a little bit too much of an understanding of what's happening in families. So <laughs> it, it becomes a discussion about, you know, what's she doing, what's he doing, how are the kids, um, yeah. it, how's, that, how's that sort of scholarship going, you know, um, are, they, uh, are they really seeing value? And, you know, I guess, you, you know, it's, it's always a line, you know, where you don't actually want to be, sort of straying across from being a professional relationship into starting to give relationship advice, for example. But um, because you know what's going on, um, it makes for a, a free and easy conversation, regardless where there's not a lot to talk about, you know. And it's as much the – it's not just about what's happening in world markets and, and, you know, in the economy. It's what's happening in people's lives as well. We're, I think we're friends more than – as well as um, – being professional advisors, I think, you know, they're, again, you know, that probably blurs a line that that isn't a comfortable thing for a lot of people. But, mm. um, you know, I'm um, I'm more than happy to be there because we're all we all come from families and we all have stuff going on, as they say. So, uh, you know, yeah. we feel privileged to be a part of it in a lot of our clients' lives. So, keep it personal. I love that. Fantastic. I know that I uh, sometimes tiptoe along that line. Uh, yeah, it's some of the things that you end up discussing, but I suppose it's uh, it's it's good to uh, you know be able to have those conversations with clients. So, um, okay, and so like with the so with your segments, you you've got these different touch points and different things that you do. Um, how does it work from a from a pricing perspective? Like, you, do you have set charge rates for your different segments, and uh, or is it variable? And then, yeah, how do you approach that? So with regards to the fees, um, we've certainly, you know, as I said, we started with um, what I call the cocktail approach where we um, have, um, you know, part fees, part commission. Uh, and over time we've moved towards um, flat fees reflective of the value and complexity of advice as well as the hours taken to deliver the services. Um, so as far as that goes... Um, you know, our services are reflective of um, a $275 an hour um, charge-out rate, I guess, for, for the principal advisor. Um, and we build uh, the number of hours to deliver the various service packages and that then gives us um, the types of fees that we would be then looking to charge. And, um, you know, again, while we would say a platinum is um, a particular size of client. It's not a platinum is a seven and a half thousand dollar a year client. A platinum might be anywhere from a five thousand dollar a year client to a ten thousand dollar a year client. It just depends on the services that make up that individual. You know the the the, the weight of those services in that individual service package. Uh, and again, the client writes the story. Um, and as long as we're sort of delivering able to deliver on that service, um, you know, what what the requirement of a particular client 
uh, in a platinum role may be may be different to another platinum at which part, at which price will will charge accordingly and review um, based on the previous year to see um, where in fact we've we've sort of um, you know over sort of overcharged or undercharged and we can adjust and we have adjusted um, with regards to looking back at what we've done and the FDS is a great um, tool to be able to do that we um, keep time in the X plan um, software as well so it gives us a reality check of just how much time we're actually spending with particular clients um, mm-hmm. so that's that's really where we go with our, our service packaging and, and just making sure that's relevant to people um, to and support so what's guidelines the for, what's the process sorry to interrupt but what's the process there for <laughs> reviewing I know we, we spent a lot of time talking about that the other day um, but uh, you know, is it an annual thing that's prompted with your fee disclosure statements to see where someone's came out in relation to where you're expecting them to? And then uh, what's the process around you doing that? So the annual review is the one where we're actually looking at what we're charging um, for the services that we've delivered over the course of the year. And again, you know, that that is reflective of the, the data that's in X-Plan um, and that allows uh, us to, you know, you know, it'll be one review a year where we're doing the FDS. For those clients that opt in, we review and opt in the, the opt-in clients every year. We don't we don't wait for the two years that we've got. We opt them in every year as part of our engagement and our ongoing engagement. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is, you know, where we're basically looking at um, where there is a, um, you know, request, where there is a, a need to sort of look at the fees mm-hmm. Um then we'll look at that prior to the meeting and then at the meeting we'll actually communicate that um, for the next, you know, if it's an opt-in or even if it's an FDS client, we'll be talking about um, what the fees will be going forward based on the activities that we've we've seen. So um, it's, it's a matter of being active. I don't want to take the fees off the table and just hide the FDS at the back of the... Um, the portfolio of reports that we're giving to clients. So we really want to bring it out and make it front and centre. Um, and it's a part of communicating the value of your advice as well, that you're actually um, prepared to actually put that front and centre when you're having your review conversation. Yeah. And how do you find that it's that it's received when you have those discussions with clients? Um, I guess there's been a bit of trepidation out there in the industry, uh, in the profession really around how people would perceive the fees, how people would, um, you know, when they actually saw a large, uh, a large fee, you know, seven thousand dollar fee. Um, in reality, I haven't really had a lot of a lot of a problem with the fees. I've never really had anyone sort of say, "Well, I'm, you know, I don't want to go forward. I don't want to keep paying. Uh, I don't think you're providing the value that you have set out to achieve, and I'm not getting value from this relationship." Um, I, to put it it bluntly, I I guess it's probably the same as a lot of people. Um, It's hard to actually um, sell that, sell a big fee up front. You know, like when you first meet somebody who's a, um, who's someone that's come in from an accountant or has been referred from somewhere else. Um, Not so much people that have been referred by their family, but if it's someone that's been referred from outside, um, that's the hard bit, the initial engagement. But once you've got a relationship and a strong relationship, I think that feeds into um, the receptiveness for that ongoing sort of discussion on fees and, and services provided. So, yeah, it's about building the relationship, I think, and um, and keeping that relationship strong through those touch points we've talked about. Fantastic. Relationship first and uh, everything flows from there. I love that. Yeah, yeah I um, believe that. You know, maybe I spend more time than what, you know, an efficient, a so-called efficient financial planning practice would do on getting that good relationship with clients and just being there for people. But it's what I wanted to do. You know, this is why I became, why I left, you know, head office of a, of a big institution to come out and do face-to-face advice again. So I wanted to be a factor in people's lives and not just yeah. a money factor, but a someone that sort of would relieve people of their worries and their concerns about money and at the same time help their families, you know. It's, um, you know, it's a bigger job than just money. You know? And most yeah. people will say that, but, you know, that's 
putting it at the core of what you do is very important. Fantastic. I can, I can feel the passion. I like it. Uh, and clearly it's working for you, which is, which is great. Just one f- final question on the, on the segmentation piece. <clears throat> got you know you've got these different segments and you mentioned that some uh times you you'll work with people where they're they're going to be what uh it's considered maybe a lower value client and and might fall into one of your one of your lower segments what do you what are you actually delivering for those people and do you have like a minimum um fee that you charge or how are you keeping them engaged until they're ready to grow to the point where you can step them up uh and add more value to them so to sort of, I mean, to participate in that, those um, ongoing sort of platinum, gold, silver um, type um, packages, we really are looking for at least twenty two fifty on an ongoing basis. Um, and that might be as a result of, because we, we charge fees, but we also um, will take ongoing commission from insurances um, as well. So our, our business model is to write nothing nothing upfront on insurances. We've always written hybrid um, commission on insurances and that feeds into the revenue collected for a particular client towards those minimum standards. So, Uh um, so when it comes to um, lower value, we will do work. We will actually maybe elevate people uh, in the, uh, in the service offerings to maybe get the same service, for example, as, um, either their parents or their kids. Like we've got um, clients where, um, you know, you know, some young, younger clients are paying us, you know, seven and a half, eight thousand dollars a year for, um, you know, comprehensive advice, wealth accumulation, um, retirement planning. Uh, their parents, for example, are, are nowhere near that stratosphere. They've probably spent most of their life working to give their kids the opportunities that they've, um, been able to have to get to where they've gotten to so the parents are included in that same servicing so we'll spend as much time with the parents as we will with their kids um, yeah. because it's all about as I said it's all about that relationship and you're dealing with the family um, and um, I think there's a uh, you know again a no-no in a financial planning practice but in my place there's a bit of cross subsidization but cross subsidization that's meaningful and and knowing and I know that I'm doing it. Um, yeah. I'm aware of it, and there are reasons behind it. But it's not necessarily a no-no um, per se, as long as you know what the reasons are that you're doing it. Yeah, so, and I think it's not always, you know, you, you've got to measure against everything, but it's not always the things that you can directly measure um, that are correct. going to add to your business long term as well. Um, and so what about the individual clients where it might be more, you know, they're, they're lower touch or there's less... Uh, complexity there how do you keep keep in touch with them without going through the you know the free uh, you know face-to-face reviews in the same sort of frequency so a classic example are insurance only clients you know with with our insurance business there there are clients that there are some clients that we will travel to to go and see because of the um the amount of insurance and and their other needs that potentially could come up um throughout the relationship but there are a number of people that we have just as insurance clients that are in different states that we will, um, you know, operate on Skype or telephone call to do reviews with them as things change. Uh, a number of the people that we've um, we've gathered as insurance clients from accountant referrals are sort of property investors that have day jobs but have a number of investment properties and are always looking to build their investment properties and build their equity and then, you know, create wealth that way. So um, those reviews um, for those people, a lot of those people will be over the phone or Skype. A lot of them will be sort of um, of the mindset to be able to do an electronic type review process. Um, mm-hmm. And of, of course, that's going to be a lower touch than having a face-to-face appointment, lower cost, I guess, if you're not flying everywhere to do it as well. So yeah um but yeah it's tailoring the insurance clients are probably the biggest example of that um electronic sort of review process where we're sort of leveraging the technology to keep in touch and then all dr- driven through the x plan with your threads with your threads. correct yeah all awesome. of our activities the x plan activities will just tell us what to do um yeah. and then 
you know, when when they come up, we, you know, everybody's got to do what they've got to do. So, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Well, look, there, there are a couple of questions, a couple of other questions from people watching in from uh, from James and Mark, but uh, <clears throat> we've gone way over time as we uh, sometimes do. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm sure we could talk about uh, this all day, really. But thank you, Steve. Yeah. Um, great to hear, uh, you know, your thoughts and what supported your business. I think, uh, you know, relationships clearly a massive uh, theme and, and, you know, measuring everything and, and driving efficiencies, but not um you know not everything that's going to benefit you can be measured uh yeah. as well so, uh, i just reinforce ben i just i just sort of reinforce as a last point um people will be surprised at what their clients value from what you do for them um so please you know take the time to sort of have those deep conversations with clients from time to time to understand what they truly value. And the core data survey was, was one of those things that gave me those really good insights. But what you can value in your client's eyes is what you can actually build into your service proposition. Awesome. So don't assume, always ask. Um, and you know, I think you can't go too wrong if you are uh, if you follow the lead of your clients. So uh, great insights, Steve. Thank you again for sharing. For everyone watching in, uh, next week, we've got the uh, XY Life Forum sessions uh, and we're going to be talking about um, the the soft skills that uh, that you need to, to be an advisor. We've got a special <coughs> guest, uh, Nick Hayes, from the AFA uh, and and talking about, you know, are degrees enough? What are the, what is the answer? Uh, probably be a good one to get Steve, uh, Steve to uh, tag <laughs> in on as well, given his background in education, which we haven't been able to cover today. But... Um, thanks everyone for joining us uh, for the questions. We're going to keep the conversation going on the uh, Facebook thread. So if uh, you've got any further questions, shoot them in there uh, and, and the panelists will be jumping in there later. Um, yeah. And thanks again to our mates at AIA for, uh, for their support of XY live. So yeah, that's it. Thank and you. Don't Steve. forget um, on the 20th of July, there's the Brisbane event for anyone in Brisbane out there. Um, 20th of July. It's going to be a great evening. With, uh, with a number of advisors doing some really cool stuff in their practices around cash flow management and really going to be pulling that apart and working out um, how do we, are we, a big thing we're going to be talking about is do we teach them a fish or do we um, just generate outcomes for them? So uh, there's going to be, it's going to be a great evening on the 20th of July in Brisbane. Looking Brisbane. forward to it. Coming at you. Steve's going to be there. Uh, I'll be there. Brisbane. So uh, any of our Queensland peeps, get around it. It's going to be awesome. We're looking forward to catching up with you all uh, as well. So thank you, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you same time next week. Bye, everyone.